What's up, Facebook? We are live. We are on here. Um, we'll wait a couple seconds and we'll wait till everyone tunes in and um, checks us out. We have um, got Rick Speck and I got Troy Reinstra, um from Safe and Just Michigan with us here. We're going to be talking about a number of things. One of the one of the t topics that we're going to uh, talk about a little bit is about the whole COVID. Um, crisis going on within the MDLC. Um, it, it was just an article here just a couple days ago. I think it, I'm not for sure if Washington Post put it out or USA Today, but they described that Michigan is one of the worst, um, has has one of the worst problems going on um, in it with the COVID, that there's a number of prisoners, um, individuals there incarcerated that are battling, that, are, that have caught coronavirus and a number who have passed away. So one of the big questions that's, that's come up is about uh, should we release prisoners out of prison during this time? And I've gotten a number of comments and things all across from, from different people about what should we do during this time. And so before we get into that, that's going to be one of the topics we'll discuss. But before we get into that, uh, Rick, why don't you take about 30 seconds, introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and... Right. Yeah, yeah. my name is Rick Speck, uh, formerly incarcerated, served multiple prison terms. Last one uh, lasted 15 years. This month will be six years I've been home. Uh, currently, I work for Safe and Just Michigan as a community engagement uh, specialist behind our criminal justice uh, reform work that we're doing. Um, Matt, you in prison. Matt, Troy, same place, prison. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of full circle circle right we're all did you guys meet in prison no we met afterward okay so yeah that that's what going on you know um <clears throat> that's me in a nutshell business owner started a nonprofit that um was a service provider for men and women coming home from prison in metro detroit area uh went to work for the aclu and now i'm uh, with safe and just michigan advocating for men and women incarcerated good stuff Troy? Troy? i am troy reinstra outreach director with safe and just michigan i'm also a transitional board member with a state-based uh, formerly incarcerated led organization called nation outside uh i am also formerly incarcerated to serve 22 years on a life term sentence in 1995 for armed robbery i was released three and a half years ago and uh, have been involved in criminal justice reform ever since the day I've come home. I met Nate by way of television after there were a, a spree of shootings in the city. He was standing outside of Map Church with his hat cocked sideways, talking about they were going to do a prayer prayer vigil. I said, "I got to meet this dude." And, and then uh, I, you know, I met Rick, which is a whole other story for another day. But we weren't right. who we are today. We were a little bit rowdy back then, right? Yeah, that we weren't so saved. Cool. We weren't saved by the blood at that point. We were nah. not saved. <laughs> <laughs> Two hound dogs, huh? <laughs> well, hey, thanks so much, you guys, joining us on here um, and hanging out with us, do, being you know, doing this interview with us. So the COVID thing, Troy, why don't we start with you? Just talk talk a little bit about the for Pete because there's there's going to be individuals on here who may not, um, they're not up to speed with what's going on. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in the MDOC here in Michigan um, in terms with um, inmates, or the men there um, catching coronavirus. Yeah, so in the MDOC, actually, we're the worst in the country right now when it comes to contraction rates and rate of death. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick just to give people an example of what that looks like. It's all right, Nate. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So in Michigan, what we have is uh, we have a daily report that's put out that reflects the 
how the state is being affected by institution. And so you'll see that 18,000 people have been tested, 2,189 have tested positive, 7,251 negative. And there's, a, there's also a pending results. But our concern is this, uh, 55 people have died as it stands who are uh, labeled as prisoners. We also have correction officers who have died. Our question is, uh, you know, how many more people have to die? And so we've been doing a lot of advocacy work around that. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing my screen real quick. Uh, we've been doing a lot of advocacy work around that. Uh, did my screen stop sharing? No, it hasn't come up yet. Oh, it hasn't? No. Oh, you got me disabled. We ain't gonna worry about it. No, go. Okay, go ahead. My fault. I I didn't turn in. Try it now. Let's see what happens. There we go. Oh, share. Okay. Yep, here, here it go. is. Yeah. All right. Now it's got the nation outside. Um, yeah. So this is a this is a chart that's published every day. If you go to um, a website called Medium, just search Michigan Department of Corrections COVID nineteen. There's a website called Medium dot org. It's a, actually the Department of Corrections Union website, and they've been being really transparent about their testing. So they've been testing facility wide. They haven't tested the entire state yet. Obviously, we have uh, over thirty five thousand, almost forty thousand people in prison. <clears throat> but um, we have uh, two two thousand one hundred eighty nine cases that are positive. Uh, the number we're concerned with is fifty five that have died right here. And so you know the question we're asking is uh, how many more people have to die. We're trying to shape the narrative that this is a human rights issue and, and not just uh, releasing people from prison issue. Uh, I think it's really easy to get caught up in that debate, like who should we let go? And uh, at the end of the day, sure, we want to address the question of what does safety look like? Uh, safety and Just Michigan just did a story, uh, a web presentation on removing violence uh, from the conversation, for instance. Uh, I'm I'm labeled as a violent offender because I committed an armed robbery. There are a number of other, other people who I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis who actually are some of the best people who we would like to see re-enter the community. Uh, it's just a matter of what they've demonstrated along the way, and we want to try to find some good ways to measure a person's um, uh, le less risk that's produced to the community, but without classifying them by their uh, case. Right. Right. And I think, you know, the biggest one of the challenges is a lot of these questions haven't been answered yet because I, I, a number of folks, they just assume when, you, when individuals have had discussions about, you know, what do we do about those inside? Usually some folk will lean towards the negative. Well, they shouldn't have did what they did. I, I hear where you're coming from, but we still have a responsibility. That wasn't part of the sentence that the judge handed down. He didn't say, oh, you know, get there. After you've been there 15 years, then you're going to catch a deadly disease and could potentially die. That's not part of the sentence. So we have to respond in a way that's just and fair. And a lot of folk don't have, don't haven't asked the questions or just because they don't have the understanding, they, they don't know that individuals are looking at safety in the community. We understand completely that um, um, individuals have to be held socially accountable if they're violent in the community and hurting people. So how do you how do you answer that question with individuals coming home, like with the people coming out? What is the criteria for individuals being released? Are there enough resources? Number one, do we have an? If, let's just say if someone's been locked up for a long time and they don't have a place to go to. What do we what what should be MDLC's response or what should what should we do in a situation like that? I mean for me, I think that we have to continue to take this approach and, and do it as humanely as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's lacking right now from these conversations is humanity. Right? I mean, I think one thing that all three of us share besides being in prison is, if I'm not mistaken, all three of us were there for what is a violent crime, right? You had a violent yeah. crime, meet, right? Nick. Absolutely, yeah. Troy had one. I, I was labeled and convicted of a violent crime, right? But look at the three of us today, just as an example. 
How many of us have purported any violence since we've been home? Right. I mean, I'm coming up on six years. I've never been arrested. I've never been in the backseat of a cop car. I've never had a ticket again. Yeah. I certainly never hurt anybody. Right. right. I'm not out here assaulting people, but I carry this label as a violent offender. I'm going to carry that label for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right. But at what point have I shown or proven to society that I'm not violent? Like by nature, I'm not a violent person. And I don't think any of us are today that are, that are on this, this call. None of us are. But we're all going to carry that label. So does that mean because I purported a violent crime that I have less value? Yeah. Right? Like, okay, so the guy that didn't do the violent crime, he should get out for COVID. Right? And me, I'm three months from getting home to serve 15 years, but I'm a violent crime. So I should have to do my last 90 days because I'm violent? Since when? That's the part I, I don't like. And as a Christian, there's this little thing we believe in called redemption. Right? At yeah. what point have I been redeemed? Right? Like, I always thought it was that moment that those words came out of my lips that I professed, you know, Christ is my Lord and Savior. Right? And I'm washed by the blood of the Lamb. Like, that's when I'm getting there. But if it by society, I, what other hoops do I got to jump through to show I'm not a violent person? And yeah. we all know men and women coming home that have the same label. Yeah. That want to go out there and start a church just like you, that want to be just like Troy and director of community engagement and doing all these things with Nation Outside. He's a father. He's raising a Like he's doing all these things. Yeah. I'm doing all these things. We're, we're human beings. Yeah. I'm not going to be defined by that armed robbery. I'm sorry. That's not who I am. I know that's right. Hey, hey Nate. Yeah. Uh, Troy will call the police too. <laughs> so I, I ain't running from him no more. I'm calling him like, hey, it's a problem over here. So we understand what civic duty looks like now, right? So how does it, let me just. How hard uh, is it though, Troy? Talk about how hard that is. <laughs> Seriously. Well, so. When you have the stigma on you that you're a felon and uh, you understand that the relationship still isn't there between law enforcement, uh, when they pull up on you, you still have a label on you. They still uh, judge you as who you were and not who you are. So um, it's really hard to interface. I was just able to sit on a panel with the chief of jails for Detroit and starting to build a relationship with him. And, you know, so it takes a lot of work. But getting that burden off of you, as we said, like the mark of Cain. Is, is is difficult. I just want to touch on a couple of things you said about like getting people out. So one of the things we're talking about is uh, asking the governor to uh, expand her, utilize her ability and expand the capacity of doing commutations. Uh, she can do that. Right now we're working around an obstacle called truth and sentencing, which we can talk about, you know, later gets deep off in the um, uh, policy stuff. The second thing is we're still noticing that people are being flopped 12 months, 24 month flops. And, and it was Rick referred to a guy being uh, uh 60 days 90 days away from going home the one of the, the one of the first people who passed i think it was the third person who passed was a juvenile lifer did over 30 i think 39 years in prison and was three weeks away from coming home yeah. and died in prison yeah he was already pre-approved to be released and died in prison and then the last thing is uh, the elderly. When we look at the average of people who have died, they're over 50 years old. And we have a, a, yeah. a, a data support, something called uh, a, pro a, a, a process that a person goes to called aging out of crime. And so we have people who are uh, in geri geriatric now. They're in wheelchairs. They're, they're no longer a physical threat to the community, but they're still being held in prison and they're dying. Wow. You know, one of the um, facilities that got hit the hardest was was Cold Water, Lake, correct? Lakeland, God. yeah. Lakeland. How many? How many was it at Lakeland Correctional Facility in Cold Water? Ooh, we, I tell you what, let me. Was take it like close to like seven, eight hundred people? Yeah. And Cotton yeah. was was around the same six, seven hundred. Right, and so um, Lakeland is considered a. A geriatric prison so they have a geriatric ward there 791 people as of now uh, 791 people how big uh, how big is that facility though it was designed for 700 and now they're at uh 
over fourteen hundred, almost fifteen hundred. So that's that's more than half. That's more than half of the held there. Half. More than half of the more than half of the population has tested positive, and twenty people have passed. Wow. How do you, how do you, I I don't know, I guess the thought that comes to my mind how do you protect or how do you guard the rest of them who haven't been infected yet so to speak? how do you protect them or guard them from um, uh, catching it being that because yeah. it's it's closed quarters you know what I mean it's almost you can't yeah Rick can talk about uh, the impossibility of social distancing and then I'll talk a little bit about ventilation so well, I mean, yeah Rick go ahead it varies. I think it varies from institution to institution. As we know, you know, some are open dorm setting, like Cooper Street Correctional. I served my last like five years there. You know, 160 man dorms, you know, no ceilings, no doors. You got half walls. I mean, it's just an open. I mean, that's like, like a giant Petri dish. That That's that's what you might as well look at. And, you know, yeah, there's some fans. So what? We, we can really circulate it through the whole building. Um and then you go to even the closer confined places like, say, uh, a St. Louis, you know, level three, level four, two man rooms. How you distancing with that one person? Right. Yeah. In your room. You're the, I mean, the, the, the room is eight feet. So what, what are you going to do? You're, you're each going to be on one end of the of the cell. How, how are you going to sleep? So there's there isn't any possibility for social distancing. We're not giving them the adequate amount of soap and and say, I mean, not even sanitizer, just soap. There's deficiencies in getting those supplies to men and women. And this is supposed to be good enough. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't be good enough for, for any of my family. It wouldn't be good enough for any of my friends. And I don't think it would be good enough for theirs, but again, it's this narrative that they're prisoners. So, Hey, they shouldn't have did it. Then they wouldn't have to do this. I mean, I just I think that we have a real issue humanizing prisoners. We we like to believe that they're less than, and the reality is is they're just as equal as the next man or woman. Absolutely, yeah. Can I touch on the ventilation real quick, just a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. I want to lift up uh, Natalie Holbrook. She's a champion for people who are incarcerated. She's the director of the prison program for American Friends Services Committee. Uh, along with Demetrius Titus and uh, Jack. So Natalie raised a really interesting concern. We do something called a, a Friday family uh, support group. Zoom. You, if you go to Nation Outside or Safe Invest Michigan, you'll see it posted on our Facebook. It's every Friday. So she brought up an interesting point that the hospitals have a requirement of ventilation that meets the standards that takes out all of the uh, um, the impurities, the, the, the viral nature of, of what's in the air outside of the, the institution. The problem is uh, the institutions that we have are so antiquated, they don't have adequate ventilation that even if you separated people by six feet, it still circulates. And we see what happened in China with the, uh, the one person who was positive for COVID went to a restaurant the ventilation system was on and doing the forensics around it, what they saw was uh, the entire half of the room was affected, infected by this one person who was there. And so Natalie's position, and we agree, is that if they if they don't improve the ventilation, which they most likely won't, then they have to close those prisons because they're a health risk. Yeah, that's... A lot of this stuff will leave you all struck where it's like, Rick, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, he's muted. He's muted. Okay. Go ahead, Rick. No, I was just saying, and, and she's absolutely right. When, when, you know, a lot of these temporary, right. They've been temporary facilities for about 25 years, 20 years. These were, these pole barns, these structures were, were set up to fix a short-term need for space, right? Yeah. And now it's 20 years later, and, and they're not temporary. These are facilities that, that don't have any plans on closing. But the reality is, is if, if we have facilities that, based on their mechanicals and the way they run, they are going to put folks at risk, mm -hmm. then we need to close those facilities. Like, And we could start with those open bay and those 
poor circulation, those places, they need to go first. Do you think that I, someone had, had brought this up in conversation with how many prisons that are closed, that those who have actually contracted it be sent to a certain prison? Well, they were doing something like that. And, and so the sad part is, is I, I read this article where the DOC actually sent three infected men to an institution where there was no cases reported because they got the results mixed up, thought that these men were negative and they were going to send them to this facility of all negative people. When in all actuality, guess what? The three of them all went to the same joint and they were all positive. Wow. Just about some of these wow. Just about some of these like this are finding out about happened that we're not. I didn't hear you, Troy. You broke up. Oh, there was a little bit of delay. I didn't zoom was acting goofy. Just about some of these uh closed prisons. So for all practice purposes, the Detroit Reentry Center is vacant. Uh, but it was operational. They ran a um What's it called? Uh, dialysis unit there. Um, it's been an operational function facility for reentry. That is a, a facility that they could use to put uh, people in. The, our only concern about opening up prisons that are closed is we don't want to see any more prisons opened up. We like to see the people who are there who uh, meet, meet the criteria to be released, which is between 3,500 and 5,000, given an exclusion around this truth and sentencing law that we have in place, that could be safely released to the community immediately. Hey, if someone has their volume up on their phone, it's kicking feedback into the, if your phone volume is up, just be, if there's something else kicking sound, it's kicking back. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Rip. That's okay. Are you still, I, I'm not hearing it. Are you still getting it? No, it sounds good right now. Okay. Oh, well, I think for me, one of the most troubling things as I said before, is we're not, we're not looking at people as human beings, right? And when we also look at what Troy said about truth and sentencing, the barriers that truth and sentencing puts out there. So, for example, right now, 15% of folks that are incarcerated are eligible to be released, right, for on parole. Fifth, another 15% are, are lifers. So, they're not coming, right? Which leaves what? 70% of the population in prison, 27, 28,000 people right now, nothing can be done for them to release them sooner because of truth and sentencing, right? We're asking the governor to use these emergency executive powers to do a work around truth and sentencing so that folks that, you know, and you know, all of us know you can get a parole and you'll sit there for five months until that date comes. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the law says so, because truth and sentencing says so, because truth and sentencing says you must be in a secure facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have a parole, the parole board has looked at you and said, what? You're safe to go home, Right. You're not going to pose a threat. Well, how does making people wait four, five, six months, three months, once they get that decision, how does that help them and how does that help society? It right. don't. It doesn't, right. right? And unless we're really look, willing to look at this, look at truth and sentencing for what it is, horrible policy. That's what truth and sentencing has done. It has not made one citizen of this state safer. It has not helped to rehabilitate one offender that, that made a poor choice. And it doesn't provide service, right? We know typically for 126 years, the state of Michigan had good time. After 126 years, we decided it wasn't a good idea. I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense to me, right? We, we did it with proposal B. A couple years later, we said, nope, this ain't going to work. We're going to 
have disciplinary credits, but it was still a form of good time. Truth and sentencing came, we did away with it all. Violent, nonviolent. There's, <clears throat> I don't understand how that helps to keep the community safer. I don't understand how that helps it to rehabilitate people. It don't. You don't have to understand that one. Just it don't. <laughs> it don't. That, but there's so you know many they, reasons why it causes more harm. It than does because it's more punitive than it is All rehabilitative, punitive. right? And mm -hmm. if that, yeah, that'll take us in a different direction. But that's it, when you approach things, because most individuals in society don't realize that ninety to ninety-five percent of individuals incarcerated right now have an out date and they will be coming mm -hmm. back to our communities. Mm -hmm. So if we choose to just lock individuals up in a secure facility, not allowing them to like, for instance, I, I'm, I'm, I, I go out to a number of prisons where they have the college programs at now, like with Calvin and Hope mm -hmm. just got into, Hope College just got into Mesquite Correctional Facility. And just think if individuals had access to education while in on the inside and all of us know what education when an individual is able to acquire information and knowledge that's good positive and healthy what that does to the mental capacity what that does internally on the inside of someone and so it's like if we choose to withhold education and, and a bunch of different things and we could, we, we could take a full hour and talk about just that aspect right there. If we choose to keep that away from individuals, then when they return back home and we haven't invested, are, are given opportunities for them to invest into the cell, when they come back, if crime doesn't go down, it's like we've just reaped what we sow. We all know that punishment doesn't work. Approaching things punitively, it makes pisses people off. Yeah. Well, if I go into prison, right, for me, if I go to prison and I've never really worked a real job, I don't have skills, right? Mm -hmm. I do 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. What skills am I coming home to? Right. What, what do I have that's going to help me to earn it? We're not talking about educating folks. If we're not talking about giving them trades, if we're not talking about allowing people to become the best version of them, mm -hmm. then what happens when they come out? You know, people that are opposed to folks getting education inside, well, what do you want to do? Get an education when they come home? Yep. Like now they're a part of society. They want to work. They want to pay taxes. They want to buy a home. They want what every other American in this country wants. But how do they get it? Yeah. That's the question. And, and, and amongst, like you talked about, limited resources amongst COVID right now, right? Yep. How, how do we make this transition? How do we allow this? to happen well first and foremost we got to allow people an opportunity to become the best version of themselves and that comes through education that's hey, just Nate, my opinion I mean, that, that was the difference maker that's why i ain't going back for my fourth bit i stopped at three you know i needed a, a second chance and i needed a third chance so sometimes it's more than just a second chance yeah thank you jesus huh rick <laughs> ain't no question <laughs> Troy, <laughs> let me touch on some of the what you were talking about. People coming home being angry. So all of this is creating an issue of trust with people who are incarcerated yeah. and their families. Yeah. So just imagine, you know, being kind of trapped in the situation or being a loved one of a person who has passed and people who will pass in the future because this is just the beginning. Yeah. And so how uh, uh, I, I can only imagine that the popularity rate rating of the Department of Corrections and our governor is extremely low. And so like, how do you rectify that? How do you uh, limit the collateral consequences of that the effects of this outbreak is having within a population of people? Uh, black and brown people are the highest being affected. Um, at the community level, we're saying like people, like the jail system and the prison system doesn't have this figured out. And the interpretation of that is they don't care about us. So you're like, how do you address that? And I think that um, Rick was talking about the troubling things. And so all we've kind of been talking about are the troubling things, but some of the, the challenging things are, you know, on the other side of this whole conversation are victims. If if uh, people who have survived defenses, if, 
if we would have never went to prison in the first place, there would have never been a, a victim or now we call a survivor in the first place. And so how do we have this dialogue with them uh, that moves from a punitive conversation to a restorative conversation? And then also we, we do take an adversarial position with uh, corrections and people in government, but they're the ones who hold the power and have the ability to one, uh, make better decisions and policies, and two, they're the ones in corrections who are taking care of our loved ones. And so how do, you know, we we go by the, the practice that hurting people hurt people. And just imagine being a CEO going into this environment and having to deal with uh, some real hostile circumstances. Uh, people, are, people are hurting right now and afraid even more. And so how do we have that dialogue with them to say, look, it's time to say, okay, let's talk about the Constitution. Let's talk about Michigan policies, and let's put all that in a human rights perspective. The reality is sometimes when things get so bad, you have to look at the laws and say, this is wrong right now. And we have to change this and, and get off of our positions for the for the greater good, which the greater good is life. And, and um, there are a number of organizations who are willing to come around people who are being released and provide them with that supportive community the resources that they need so that they will be held accountable and they will be able to safely transition back into the community. And I think that's where the human rights and, and the right to life trumps all in the in, in decisions that are being made. And we have really haven't been able to breach that topic with people who are in positions of power right now. Yeah, true. I'm yeah, that it definitely I'm gonna go back to my mind stuck on the <clears throat> having the conversation keeping the victims in mind, right? Um, there, there is that whole piece where we can't, we can't, we have to be fair and just because people were hurt, especially those, you know, when I talk with, when I go back in or if I'm talking with uh, folk who come through Fresh Coast, I say, you know, there, it, it's one thing when everyone, when you got individuals who are in the game and everyone signed up for this lifestyle and you get caught slipping. Now it's a totally different thing when you're when you're harming and going after individuals. They're not in the game. These are law-abiding citizens who pay their taxes, take care of the yeah, families. Yeah, say civilian citizen. Yeah. Now you know when I was in the streets, I knew what I was doing. You know, I got caught got caught slipping a couple of times by other uh, different groups that we were beefing with at the time. That was a part of the game. Now, I, I believe if an individual, he signs up for it, wanting to be a part of that, and then he wants to run to the police crying about, oh, oh they did this. Come on, man. You signed up for this. Now, if the pressure's too far, the game. Up, right? Talk so, it up to the game. Yeah. That's just, it's just a part of that whole lifestyle. But when you have victims who aren't a part of that, and there, there has to be some form of social accountability and there has to but, be something. But so you know, how do you, Troy, it, what? the numbers do reflect, though, right? And and I think Troy may even know the numbers a little uh, better than me. But the numbers do reflect that, by and large, survivors of crimes would like to see rehabilitation, right? And the large, I mean, I think it's like 70% would like to see the person rehabilitated, not yeah. necessarily a longer prison sentence. So even from the survivor standpoint, the policies that we're, we're doing, the laws that we have and the way we're sentencing and treating folks that have broken the law, even they don't agree, right? Yeah. Even then you'll have people going up in front of the judge and saying, you know, this isn't what I want for this person. What I would like for this person is to get rehabilitated, to be able to come back to our community, yeah. right? Because most of the times, folks cause these harms in their community. Yes, people do venture from one city to another, commit it. But by and large, the, the bulk of the harm that's being done in everyone's communities are being done by people from that community. Right. Right. And so people, in order to see their community healed, they want to see the people that are causing the harm in the community healed. Mm -hmm. And if we can start to put resources there and effort there and understand that just because a person gets a 10 year sentence versus a five year sentence doesn't mean they're coming home any, any better. Doesn't mean in 10 years, the community is going to be any safer than if they would have went for five years, had a mentor, had some, you know, some kind of education, whether it was in a trade, whether it was, you know, just allowing people to start to understand what is a possibility for them. 
if we can do that in survivors, these, these are numbers that survivors want to see. This just isn't coming from, you know, my perspective, the person that was formerly incarcerated multiple times. This is coming from, like you said, citizens, people that want their communities to be better. You know, and we all know that those closest to the problem are often also closest to the solution. So let's get some more of these people that have solutions out in our community and start solving, you know, basically healing the harm. And if we can do that, then everything's going to shrink. But it has to start by looking at folks that are coming home as having value. Yeah. Yeah. They are a value to our society. They're not always a burden, right? And and sometimes, yeah, they may have to get a bridge card. They may need some assistance, but that's a short time. Yeah. By and large, folks are wanting to come home to do better, to be better. They want the American dream just like we all do. Yeah. And they're not afraid to work for it because they've been working for about $20 a month. So they're good with that little pay, pay increase they're about to get. <laughs> Richard Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we could keep going and going and going on this conversation. Let's shift real quick as we got a few minutes left, Troy, about some of the resources that we talked about that are out there for um, that individuals can connect with. Why don't you share a little bit of that with us, Troy? Take take yourself off of mute. All Go right, ahead. I'm gonna share my screen real quick, just one more time to give people. Uh, idea of what they can do. Man, I got a lot of pop-ups jumping off. I'm not that important. <laughs> Apparently you are. What do you mean? You are. Um, you're you're amazing, Troy. So um one thing is that Nation Outside is doing is we're looking to hear from people who are directly impacted how COVID-19 is affecting them. If you go to the Nation Outside uh, Facebook page this Saturday from three to five, we're going to have a a community-based listening session, but we're also going to provide as many links as a person can have uh, needs to uh, resources. So I encourage you to go to the uh, Nation Outside events page. And then also there's a a resource out there called um, Michigan Justice Response to COVID-19. Uh, It's a project that's being done between philanthropy, advocates, and um, people who are at the policy and and lawmaker level. And uh, there's more resources on there that it'll make you dizzy. Uh, So a lot of times we don't think that there are resources out there. There are. Uh, For instance, if you were a a juvenile and you've been related to the criminal justice system, there's a guy named Aaron Kenzel, who's the executive director of uh, Michigan Youth Justice Fund. They have resources, cash resources, for people who can say that they were a juvenile and were subject to the system. Uh, doesn't matter how many years, doesn't matter how long you've been home. Uh, so that's another thing. And then um, I, I won't cite their name, but there's another organization that's going to do a cash assistance to people who are coming home from Detroit. So there are resources out there. The question, the problem is it's really hard to navigate for, for us sometimes because we don't have like the aptitude, that technical uh, aptitude to search things out. And then if you go to the Nation Outside page, you can see things that are coming up and also Safe and Just. Uh, follow them on Facebook and check out their website. There's more resource information. So between between those three, uh, those, those three sites, the Michigan COVID uh, Justice Response, uh, Nation Outside's uh, uh, social and, and homepage and Safe and Just Michigan, you, you should be able to uh, get straight. And if you have needs that aren't being met there, just drop something in, uh, send a message to Nation Outside. Safe and Just and uh, Nation Outside is working together and we'll find ways to, to at least get some answers to your question, if not, if not being able to connect you directly to some resources. So I encourage everybody who's like directly impacted or cares about the criminal justice and to show up at our uh, state meeting. Uh, it's May 16th, this Saturday, three to five. And uh, we'll be listening to what everybody's concerns are and try to find ways to address those. Cool. Like it. <clears throat> That's good. So um, like Troy said, get on the uh, nation outside their website, safe and just website. And you'll find some more information about this. And if this is a, a 
platform of interest that you have, please check them out. I mean, this would be in, in check them out on Facebook nation outsides on Facebook as well. Right. Yep. And safe and just. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one more tidbit. Yep. Over 3 million people in the state of Michigan have convictions on their record. The last election presidential Three election million. was won by 10,000 votes. Every year we release 10,000 people from the Michigan department of corrections. There's something wrong with that math. Yeah. Um, we, we need to get engaged in the civic process, uh, exercise of civic duty, uh, get registered to vote. It's the easiest thing to do in the country right now. You can do it online, same day, uh, absentee ballot from your couch, you can vote. So we'll talk about that more later. But uh, we, we need people who are directly impacted to, to, to not forget where they came from. Absolutely. Which, yeah. which reminds me, and another good way to bring attention to this is, with American Friends Service Committee, every Tuesday from 1 to 3, we do a Twitter storm with a hashtag of let my people go, L-E-T-M-I, capital M-I for Michigan, people go, in order to reach the governor, to reach the lieutenant governor, to reach Heidi Washington, you know, with these messages, with these stories, because here's the here's the reality Um the governor's been very quiet on what's going on in prisons, right? There isn't a plan, you know, okay, so the parole boards work in seven days, they said, for the next year in order to get more and more parole hearings. But again, we have 15% of the population that's ready to come home. So beyond that, then what? There is no plan. There are no talks. You know, her office hasn't reached out to some of the key stakeholders like Safe and Just, like American Friends, like other orgs, like Nation Outside, to even ask, you know, what does this look like? What do some solutions to these problems? And we have a lot of solutions to these problems, right? That are humane, that are safe for the community as well as for the folks that are coming home. And so the troubling part is, is our governor has been exceptionally quiet when it comes to this population. And I would just encourage folks to really take a look at that. You know, what does that mean for us as a state when you have 38,000 people that are incarcerated in cages and we're not looking at it from the government's perspective, from our leadership? How often, I mean, how are we going to say it's okay to put these folks at, at risk of death? You know, and so I'm, I'm just kind of putting this call to action out there for folks to get involved, you know, um, whether it's the Twitter storm, whether it's you know, calling your legislator, calling the governor, people need to get involved. This affects every one of us, whether you have somebody in or don't, because chances are at the rate that we're going in Michigan, you will, right? Like one in three people know somebody that's like, it's going to happen. It's a matter of when, and do you want your loved one treated this way? Is this acceptable? If this was your daughter, your son that went in for a poor choice they're in for a couple years or even a long time and they're about to come home they paid that debt and we're putting them at risk of dying is that acceptable it's not it's not acceptable on any level uh, on that note i'm gonna quote my friend daryl woods who said the eyes of god are on us yeah. Amen. Good. good stuff well thanks so much you guys uh hanging out with us today and most and everyone on facebook world um let us know if, if you're watching right now hit us with some thumbs up if you enjoyed this conversation here just keep on the like button so that we know that um that you enjoyed this conversation and is this something that you'd like to see us do monthly if possible if there's uh and we could tackle different topics such as truth and sentencing um i know a lot of the conversation that individuals have expungement what are what are what are we clean doing? Slate. What what are we doing with clean? Yeah, most people have never even heard of clean slate. But what's going on around expungement? What's going on around a lot of the hot topics surrounding us uh, in criminal justice world here in Michigan? So, um, if you'd like that, let us know. And uh, I'm sure Rick and Troy'd love to be back on here and have some more conversation about that. So we appreciate Thanks, everyone. Dude. Thank you so much for tuning in. And. Uh, yeah, just hanging out with us this afternoon. We saw some of the comments uh, down there. So thank you so much for those. And we'll plan on seeing you guys next time. Love you.